morning, church. It's good to see uh, some, um, some old faces. Um, and yeah, just, just to have uh, the time that we can share in worship. Um, as we usually do, if I can uh, invite us to bow our heads once more, and we'll, we'll come and ask God for his grace. <clears throat> God, we, we do ask, Lord, that you would be gracious to us, even as you have given us your word. You have not, not left us without a witness of the way of salvation, Lord, but we, we also know that our hearts are dull, our eyes are naturally blind, and our ears are blocked, and so we need your grace, your Holy Spirit, to enable us to understand, to know, to know your will and to, to love your will, to have that resolution to obey your commands. Lord, I also ask, Lord, that you would enable me to speak clearly so that I might uh, faithfully relay your message to your people. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today I'm going to talk about politics, and because our passage uh, touches on politics. The thing about politics is that it is a touchy subject. Uh, for example, in the not too distant past, maybe in the last decade or so, before the last dec decade or so, there was an unspoken rule. Um, that I think it was the, the boomer generation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with baby boomers. You guys maybe know boomers, but baby boomers, the um, common among that generation, there was an unspoken rule that politics should not be discussed around polite company. Uh, well, it's two rules. You shouldn't talk about religion and you shouldn't talk about politics. And so in workplaces, in, uh, when, when you're with acquaintances, when you're with your neighbors, you just don't go there. You don't talk about politics. And the reason that there was this rule is that politics has the potential to be explosive, right? It, it brings out our deepest emotions often, and it often, conversations about politics can reveal, can show that there, is, there are deep divides between us. And so that was before, but today, even more so, uh, this potential volatility when we talk about politics has, has not changed at all. Per, I, th I think, in my, in my view of things, it probably has gotten worse. And yet, the, the rules have changed. Before, it was, you shouldn't talk about politics. Now, especially with social media and everything, right, politics is perhaps one of, the, one of the things that people are very free to talk about. People talk about politics all the time. And in, in fact, there's social pressure upon us these days, perhaps some of you are familiar with this, where, where there's pressure that we ought to uh, make our voices heard, right? If you're silent about this issue, there's something wrong, we're gonna come after you. So you, you better make your uh, you, better, you better use your voice, your social media presence, in order to align with the movement, the movement, whatever that movement might be, right? Nowadays, you're not even allowed to stay on the sidelines uh, when it comes to politics. Even more so than in the past, but this has always been the case, politics uh, is, a, is a fault line. Politics shows there are people on this side and people on that side. For, as an example, um, these days, you guys have heard of in, uh, interracial marriage? Interracial marriage is it's marriage between different uh, people of different races, right? White, black, Asian, Latino are the categories that we have in the States, right? Those rates have gone up over time, and those but you know what's gone down, significantly down? 
mixed marriages between different political parties, right? M mixed marriages between different political parties are a no-no these days. They're down to like 4% or something, single digits, right? People of different political persuasions do not get married these days. That's the big taboo because that's where everyone's loyalties and, and uh, emotions lie. Now, let me ask you, why is politics, I'm using that in a singular form, why is politics so important to many people? Why do you think it's so important to many people? Well, it makes sense because politics touches on very important things, like on how our society is organized. It affects what's lawful in our country, what's unlawful, not only in our country, but in our state, in our city, right? Politics determines who's in authority, who has the power to make these changes. And increasingly in our country, people see politics as the answer not to some social problems or to this and that, but to all our problems. There, all of these streams of reasons explains why there's so much potential for division when it comes to politics. Now, there happens to be an election coming up. Uh, Joe prayed about it in view of 1 Timothy chapter 2, right, where the, the Apostle Paul commands us to pray for kings and people in high positions. There's an election coming up, and perhaps some of you have noticed the flood of ads. Some of us have an ad blocker, or you don't watch TV, or maybe you just are blind to it all. But others of you, maybe you've, seen, you've noticed, it's hard to avoid the flood of ads that, that pour down upon us um, every couple of years. And many of these ads are attack ads. You guys know what attack ads are? It's, you, you can tell right away with the, with the voice. I'm not going to say any names, but, oh, that man, Charles Shin, look at, and then clip. Just th two second clip saying something ridiculous and then red letter blocks, dark, dark, you know, the screen is dark. You know an attack ad when you see it. What do they do? What do these attack ads do? They catch politicians at their worst moments. Um, they, they take a clip of a, of a speech taken out of context. Uh, they paint a very distorted picture. It's, it's often a caricature, a cartoon. And these attacks can get very vicious. And why, why is this the case? Because when it comes to politics, because it's so important, they say, anything goes. Anything goes. Even if the ad itself is fundamentally a lie, anything goes. And the emotions are running high, again, when it comes to politics. So you combine these two factors, that anything goes and the emotions run high, and you can see why this, the state of political dialogue is the way it is. And really, the, the political dialogue often, whether, it comes, whether it's the attack ads or even debates, it really comes down to who can out-accuse the other person. You're bad, well, you're worse, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now the question is, when did it get so bad? When did it get so bad? It turns out that ours is not the first generation or even the first nation to behave in this way. Even back in Jesus' day, or especially back in Jesus' day, political discussion also generated more heat than light. And so you can see why in today's passage, Jesus' enemies, they ask this particular question because they know that politics will, will bring out these emotions and it's, it's, it's easy for them to sow division by asking this question. And as we've seen in prior weeks, the reason these people come and ask Jesus this question is not because they want to learn from him, but they want to catch him. Recall, recall from last week that 
Jesus had just told a parable against the religious leaders. You remember this? The religious leaders are the evil tenants of God's vineyard who've not only been ignoring God's servants, the prophets, but they have been severely mistreating the prophets. And then at the end of that parable, Jesus gives a prediction that in four coming days, in the, in the coming days, the religious leaders will kill the beloved son of the father. Now, how hard-hearted are these religious leaders? How willfully blind are they? Because does Jesus' parable cause them to uh, reflect upon themselves at all? Does, does Jesus' words cause them to examine themselves, do a little soul-searching? You would think, right? Uh, he, Jesus tells this parable that, he, that basically says that you are just like your fathers who killed the prophets. There might be some soul-searching. Some Could it be true? Not at all, sadly. Right? That's how hard-hearted they are. Verse 19, the beginning of our passage says, The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour. Basically, as soon as they heard the parable, it doesn't provoke any self-examination, but immediately we got to, let's see, we've got to kill him. For they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. The only thing that stops them from going ahead to get him, to kill him, is the people, the crowd there. Again, the only thing that stops the religious leaders for now from murdering Jesus is that they fear man. And as we were saying in our Bible uh, Sunday school upstairs, uh, if you have the fear of man, that means that you do not have the fear of God. They're mutually exclusive. They don't ask to themselves, what does God say about this matter? That's not a concern at all. Rather, their only question is, what will people, what will the people think? What will the people think? Truly, here's an oxymoron. A, these are godless religious leaders. Right? You, would, you assume that religious leaders are godly, but tr these are godless religious leaders. And again, they, all they worry about is other people. They're not worried at all about what God says. And so they devise a scheme. Verse 20 says, they, So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere. Spies. This is their plan. Trickery. Deception. Pretending. And when you, when you think about those words, their plan is properly, can be properly described as satanic. We simply need to flip back to Genesis 3 to see how Satan operates. Satan in Genesis 3, he it comes in the form of a serpent. And the serpent, how, what is his methodology? He pretends to be for Eve. He's, he's a friend. He's coming as a friend for Eve, right? You guys know the Genesis 3? The serpent is an advocate. He's speaking on behalf of Eve. He, hey, I just want the best for you. And likewise here, these spies, what is their method? Pretending. Insincerity. Okay, we see their methodology. But what about their goal? What is their goal? This, uh, verse 20 continues, that, thy, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. They want Jesus to say anything that they can use to accuse him. Their plan is to accuse him before the governor, the governor in particular, because he has the power to, uh, to apply capital punishment, the death penalty. Again, their goal is properly described as satanic. The word Satan means, you guys know what the word Satan means? It means accuser. 
In Revelation 12, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren, the, the accuser of the brothers. Satan wants nothing more than for people to stand condemned to death. That's his goal. And the religious leaders, likewise, they take a page out of Satan's playbook and they are, doing, they are following that same plan. So we have a methodology, we have trickery, we have a goal, which is accusation. And finally, they have a technique. Technique. How will they trick Jesus? Verse 21. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality. You truly teach the way of God. Their words happen to be all true. But they, those people, they don't believe a word of it. What are they doing? They're using flattery. They're, to use an expression, they're, they're buttering him up. They're trying to get Jesus to lower his defenses. Again, need I say it, their technique is satanic. If you, now it's worth highlighting the way these spies go about their business. Uh, these spies who represent the religious leaders. I think this is worth pointing out or, or worth saying that if you ever find your, yourself, if you ever find yourself pretending, deceiving, if you ever find yourself delighting in accusation, if you ever find yourself using flattery, check yourself to see if you are yourself not imitating the devil as well. Well, let's continue here. Verse 22, they finally get to the question. Here's the, here's the trap question that they want to get Jesus with. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Should we Jews pay taxes to the Roman Empire or, or not? Should we give money to these pagan occupiers, these idol worshipers? Now, on its face, this is actually a legitimate question because, after all, these Romans were not welcome here. They weren't, uh, no, they, they didn't tell the, t the Jews, didn't say, hey, come on over and rule over us. These are conquerors who have, you know, they've conquered the, the, the whole world at that point, and they were forcing the Jews, along with everyone else, to pay taxes at the point of the spear. Now, and there was a wide range of opinion among Jews during that time about this question, about whether or not they, they should pay, pay taxes. There were a lot of strong opinions about this question, just like there are a lot of strong opinions today about certain political questions. Back then, many people felt strongly about politics. You guys know that one of the disciples named, was named Simon the Z Zealot. Z Zealots uh, stand on one end of this political spectrum. It's hard for, maybe they stand on the right. Uh, they wanted to... They wanted to uh, do a revolution to, to, to overthrow the Romans. And there were, there were some on the other side, the Sadducees we'll talk about next week. The Sadducees were, uh, they had no problem with this arrangement and they, they, want, they wanted to go along with it. Right? There were many people with strong opinions about this question. And so it appears on its face that this is just an innocent question. They're just simply asking Jesus, hey, where do you fall in this debate? Are you on this side or that side? We just want to know what your opinion on this matter is. Maybe you can clear it up for the rest of us here in Jerusalem. But of course, we know that their question is not innocent. Because first of all, they think that Jesus is like them. And what are they like? They fear people. So they think that Jesus also fears the people. They also think that Jesus, fear, um, he's, he's trying to get the crowds to support him. Or he's afraid of the Roman authorities. So they think that they, they've caught Jesus in a catch-22. You guys know what a catch-22? A catch-22 is a situation in which uh, either of the two choices are bad. One choice is going to lead down a ba bad path, but the other choice, that itself is also going to catch you down, put you down a bad path. And they think that they've caught him. Because if Jesus says, yes, pay the tax to Caesar, then he will lose the support of the crowd because many, many Jews hated the tax Many Jews were expecting a political Messiah who's going to save them from the Roman Empire. And how can such a Messiah say, pay the tax to, this, to Caesar? 
He's not going to say that because he's like us. He fears the people. So probably what he's going to say is, no, don't pay the tax, especially since we're coming, we're coming on all smooth here. We're flattering him. He thinks we're safe. He's going to say, don't pay the tax. And as soon as he says that, we're going to pull out our tape recorders. Well, they didn't have that, but they have witnesses. We're going we're gonna to go to the Roman authorities, and we're going to tell them, hey, take that man. He's an insurrectionist. He's a revolutionary. He's telling everyone to not pay their taxes. Uh, capital punishment for him. You see, you see their strategy here? See, modern-day politics is about catching your opponents in a goof so you can make an attack ad. And, and the religious leaders, they'll do you even one worse. They, they're going to catch Jesus in his words so that they can deliver him up to the Romans to be killed. Clearly, these spies do not mean to learn anything by their question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? That's not the point here. Nevertheless, there is a legitimate question here. And this question here, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not, it's relevant not only for back then, 2,000 years ago, in, in Judea, in Roman-occupied territory, but today, here in America. And the question is this. We don't have Caesar. We have uh, regular government, or not regular government, uh, democratically uh, elected republic, republic gover government. The question is, how should God's people, how should Christians... How should we relate to the government? Especially to secular, non-Christian government. To put the question in a different way, how should a citizen of God's kingdom, right, if you're a believer, you are a citizen of God's kingdom, how should a citizen of God's kingdom live in Caesar's kingdom? Jesus, it says in verse 23, perceived their craftiness. He saw right through the facade that they were putting on. Jesus can see through their fakery. Now, I don't think this is an example of Jesus using his divine power, the fact that he is the Son of God and he has divine power, to see through their pretending. I think this is an example of Jesus simply being wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. Uh, Matthew 10, Jesus tells his disciples, you've got to be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. He's, ta he's, t he's telling the disciples, human beings, to be like that, and he himself was that in his own life. He could see through their little plot, and not just because he was accessing his divine knowledge, but simply through his wisdom. He could see that they're pretenders, flatterers, and they're trying to accuse him. Even, and he can see through all this even while he per personally doesn't participate in any, in any of that. Right? He is himself innocent as a dove. And how does Jesus respond? He doesn't say what you would expect. Well, I'm a, I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat. I'm with these guys, I'm with those guys. Instead, he... He actually lives up to those flattering words. You know, the flattering words that the fakers, they didn't mean those words. But in fact, he actually does what those words say. First of all, they call him teacher. That's what he does. He teaches. They say, oh, you show no partiality. Partiality means that you, you change your message based on who's in the, who's in the crowd, right? You, you want to get, you wanna get the, si the crowd to be with you, so you, you say what they want to hear. And if you talk to a different crowd, you say what they want to hear. You know, many politicians, they do that. But Jesus shows no partiality. It doesn't matter who's listening, he's going to say the same thing. He also teaches the way of God. He truly answers the question, how should the people of God relate to Caesar? To the government, that is. So he says, verse 24, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. A denarius was a coin worth about a day's wages for a laborer. So let's say in modern day terms, that's about $100 or $200. Uh, and Jesus gets them to pull this coin out. And by getting them to pull the denarius out, he's, they demonstrate that they participate in the economy. Right? They have, they have, their pocket has a denarius in it. It means that they're using the Roman currency. They're participants in the economy and the government system that's set up by the Romans. 
And they receive some, some of the benefits of participation, which is that they have money in their pockets. So step one, he shows that they're involved, whether they admit it or not, they're part of the system. And then he asks, whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they say Caesar's, right? Similar to how our coins today, they have pictures of presidents or people who we think are presidents. Roman coins also had pictures of the emperor, of whoever was the emperor at that time. And Jesus is offering a pithy lesson for these spies and for everyone else who's listening, including us. He says to them, then render to Caesar, hey, this coin, it has a picture of Caesar on it. Then render, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So the short answer to their question is, yes, pay your taxes. Give to the king, yes, even to that pagan king, Caesar, who claims to be a god, give him your due, what you owe him. Now, why does Jesus say this? Is Jesus saying that he approves of Caesar and all that he does? That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that he approves of him. Rather, the unspoken premise here is that God, God in his sovereignty ordains rulers and governments over people. We understand that no government is perfect. No earthly government is perfect. They knew it. We know it. Human governments always will be far from perfect, will be very flawed. Many of them are corrupt, inefficient, unjust, unrighteous. But, but, some government is better than no government. Governments, even though they can be bad, are still necessary in order for there to be some form of safety, order, stability, and peace. That's what governments are for, so that there can be safety, order, stability, and peace. If you don't have government, you can't have those things. I don't know if you guys heard on the news, uh, in South Korea there, there was on, I think it was on Halloween day, there was this, uh, what, uh, what's it called? Uh, Stampede. There was a stampede in this in this in in uh, the capital city, Seoul. There's this. Um, they have small alleyways, and people are out partying, and and uh, a huge crowd went into this one alley, and there weren't crowd controls measures. When you have 100,000 people, for example, I think that was the number, 100,000 people in a small alley, and there weren't crowd control measures to control the flow of which way people should go, basically uh, over 150 people just died like this because, because uh, the crowd control measures weren't, weren't put in place. That's just an example of, you can see why you need crowd control measures, right? When you have this many people living together, you need people in authority, people to at least direct traffic. When you don't even have something simple as that, not only might you have disorder, you might have chaos, you can have just 150 people just die like this without a government, without, or if you have failures in government, you can't even have a society. The things that we generally ex expect, safety, order, stability, peace. So let's look at the Romans. Did they do that? They certainly provided a lot of that. The tax dollars, sure, a lot of it went to the, to, went to the emperor, and so he could uh, have a nice palace and all, but a lot of it also went to the roads. You know, the Romans built the first highway system in the ancient world, right? They, it went to the courts. There's some semblance of a justice system. There's, there were criminal, cr if there were crimes committed, they were, you know, there was, a there was some sort of police force to go after cr to criminals, so on and so forth. There was stability, peace. You guys, you guys know the Pax Romana, right? There was those things. What do Jesus' words mean for us? We have a different form of government. We have a democratic system of government in which we elect officials. It means for us to render to Caesar, unto him what, what a Caesar means, we ought to be good citizens. 
That means pay your taxes. It means obey laws. Not obey some laws, but we should obey the, all the laws. We should honor whoever's, whoever's in office. All right, this is one that's really been falling off a lot, but Romans 13. Romans 13 says, honor the emperor. The emperor was a bad guy. Honor the emperor. And likewise, we should honor whoever's in office for us. And we ought to pray for them, just as it says, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We ought to vote in elections. We have that, that right and freedom, and also that's, that's one way that we, are, we can uh, get, render to Caesar what is his. We should work for the good of, the, of our neighbors. These are some ways that we can keep, we can follow Jesus' command. But Jesus does not stop there. He answers their question and more. He gives them a bonus. Jesus' teaching is not complete, in fact, without this second half. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now, okay, what, what does that mean? Give to God the things that are God's. Some of those listening there, maybe some of the Romans there who were not Jews, or maybe some secular people t today, when they hear that, give to God the things that are God's, they might think, oh, does that mean give him a tithe? Does that mean perform your religious duties on your religious day? Like, does it mean, like, go to the church service on a Sunday? Is that what it means to give to God the things that are God's? The Jews would have understood exactly what he was talking about, because just as the coin bore the image of Caesar, and that's how you know it belongs to him, who or what bears the image of God? We, human beings, bear the image of God. Genesis 1, man is created in the image of God. So what Jesus is saying is not, hey, give to Caesar what, what belongs to him, like your, your taxes and vote, et cetera, et cetera, and then give to God what belongs to him, like come to go to church on Sundays. And No. To give to God the things that are God's means not just a tithe, a portion, an hour of a day or even a whole day. It means to give your whole self. You bear the image of God. So you must give your whole self to God. So that actually, let's rewind a little bit, colors how we consider that first part of his phrase. To give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's does not mean that we, we must unthinkingly, in every case, just submit to the government. Oh, the government said this, we've just got to do it because we've got to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. There's a second part. And the second part says that we have a higher authority. We are to submit to the government only as far as, only as much as it is compatible with our submission to God. So that if there is any conflict between obeying Caesar or obeying our government and obeying God, we must follow what the apostles said in Acts 5. The apostles said this to, to the Jewish authorities. He, they said, we must obey God rather than men. And if there's any conflict between the two, we must always obey God rather than men. But this also really speaks to, to what, what I perceive, many people have perceived to be an idolatry of our current age, which is that, I already mentioned before, that government often, for many people in this age, is people's highest hope. Government is an idolatry these days because, and we see it coming out during the election cycle, right? There, so much, not pressure, but so much is riding on the results of this election. Do you hear it? Do you hear it in the ads? Do you hear it in the, in the, in the propaganda out there? And it's not just propaganda. These people believe it. Hey, if you don't, if, if the results of this election are not right, democracy will be over. Life as we know it will be over. The stakes just keep getting higher and higher every election cycle. This is the election of our lifetimes. And the next one. And the next one. And it shows that really people really put their hope into government. 
People really believe that the right government can lead to heaven on earth and the wrong government will lead to hell on earth. So choose wisely. People think this way because God is not a part of their worldview. Or if he is, he's practically a non-factor. If he's a part of their worldview, it's, it's so that they can go to your church and make a political speech. But again, to render to God the things that are God's, in that command, Jesus is teaching us that we owe our highest allegiance to God and not to men. Now, what does this mean, practically speaking? Well, of course, uh, just right off the bat, uh, we ourselves cannot be subject to this idolatry of our age in which government is placed on such a high pedestal. We've got to be aware of that and ourselves not also bow down to that idolatry. But in other cases, here's a case. Uh, there may be times when Caesar, that is the government, will require us to do something which is not right, which goes against his commands, which goes against his will. To go back to Acts chapter 5, the reason the apostles said to uh, the Jewish authorities, We've, we must obey God rather than men, is because the Jewish authorities were telling them, what were they telling them? You guys know what happened in Acts 5? The Jewish authorities were saying, you've got you to stop speaking in, in that man's name, Jesus' name. You've got to stop um, causing all this chaos in our city, preaching about Jesus. And, and they responded, we've got we to obey God rather than to men. And so, to use that illustration itself, if the government were ever to tell us, now this, this is not the case uh, directly in, in, our, in our society, but it is the case in many other societies now in the world. If the, if the government ever says to us, you must not evangelize. You must not evangelize. Well then, our allegiance is to God. We must disobey Caesar, our, the earthly authorities, in order to obey our heavenly authority. Uh, another way to apply this principle, or another way that this principle can be applied, is for Christians and the church to speak out against immorality, against injustice, against unrighteousness. In other words, Christians and the church can and must speak the truth when the government is in the wrong. And yes, to do so is to put yourself at risk. Now, it's easy for me to say this because we're in America and, and ostensibly we have freedom of speech. In many ways, we do. But in many other places, again, today, many other places today, to boldly speak the truth, to criticize an immoral, unjust, unrighteous government is to put yourself in the way and to put, put yourself in harm's way. Think of, to use the Bible, John the Baptist. Remember? How did John the Baptist go? How, how did he die? He, he was beheaded, but he was imprisoned because he had the gall to criticize Herod, King Herod, uh, about his marriage, that he was married to his uh, sister-in-law, and he shouldn't have done that. But John the Baptist, when he saw imm immorality, when he saw unrighteousness, he spoke up. He was a prophet of God, after all. And similarly for us. And I'm, I'm, when I say us, I don't merely mean us as individuals, but us as the church overall. If we, the church, are going to be a buttress, a pillar of the truth, then we must speak the truth, even when or especially when Caesar is in the wrong. Now, one thing that we've consistently seen with Jesus is that he never tells us to do something that he also himself doesn't do. You guys, you guys know that, that that's... I confess I do that sometimes, right? That's bad leadership, right? For, for me to tell my kids to do something, which I myself don't do. But Jesus, he never does that. Jesus, 
the Son of God, the Son of Heaven, the ruler of the cosmos, humbles himself and renders to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He, don't, he doesn't need to do that, but he, does, he tells us to do it, and he does it himself. Jesus paid his taxes. He obeyed laws. He honored the authorities, including the emperor. And truly, Jesus rendered to God the things that are God's. You, you know, I was talking before about how we are created in the image of God. But here's, here's a distinction that's important for us to understand. We are created in the image of God. Jesus himself is the image of God. If that sounds like the same, it's not. It's different. We are created in the image of God. We have the image of God stamped on us, let's say. But there's nothing stamped on Jesus. He is the image of God, according to the Word, according to the Bible. He is the uncreated image of God. And Jesus rendered to God his life. He laid down his life by being crucified on a Roman cross. Not because he did anything to deserve it, but he laid down his life as a sacrifice for sins. Not his own, but ours. Because, and why did he have to do that? Because, not that he had to do it, but why did he do it? It's because we, we owe complete, total allegiance to God. Render to God the things that are God's. We need to do that, but the reality is we don't do that. Our day-to-day -day lives testify to the fact that we do not do that. We are lawbreakers. We are rebels. We are outlaws and sinners before the living God. And so Jesus willingly t took his place on the cross as our crucified king. It's worth noting here at the end of our passage, the last verse says, and they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. It's interesting to note, not just that they marveled at what he said, that they were not able to catch him at what he said. All right, all right Jesus, they had all these plots and plans to get him. Right? But so easily, they punch him, he just slips it like this. Slap him back if he wanted to, but he doesn't, of course. Right? He can slip anything that they send to him. But Jesus dies on the cross later that week. Is it because they finally got to him? No, it's because he laid down his life for us. Jesus took his place up on the cross as our crucified king. This is the king we serve, the crucified king. Let us behold and adore, as we sang before, the king of love. Of course, Jesus did not remain crucified. He did not remain dead. Our crucified king is also the resurrected king. And the resurrected king, after he showed himself to his disciples and to even up to 500, 500 uh, witnesses at one point, he also, after, the end, after 40 days, ascended to heaven. And right now, he sits at the right hand of the Father. What does that mean, that phrase, that he, he sits at the right hand of the Father? Is it talking about, like, the way the chairs are seated in heaven? Well, not necessarily. It means it's the place of power. That expression, that he sits at the right hand of the Father, means that Jesus reigns from heaven right now. Our king is alive. Not only is he alive, he reigns. What is he doing in his reign? He is working all things for his glory and our good, for the good of those who love him. And here is our Christian hope that our crucified, risen, ascended king will not just remain there in heaven reigning, but he will return. Christ has promised that he will return. He says he's going to return in power and glory. And what's going to happen when he returns in power and glory? Isaiah 9 describes it. Well, many things will happen, but we're going to focus on Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 describes the kingdom that he will establish when he comes. 
of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. He's going to establish his government, his kingdom. And it will be a government of righteousness and justice and peace. This is our Christian hope. So until then, let us render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, Jesus' example. Lord, how he was wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. And you can see through, he can see through his enemies who are after him. And yet, Lord, he did not merely dodge these questions, but he truly answered them so that we would know the way to follow and obey God. But Jesus, you are not merely our example, but you are also our Savior. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you laid down your life. They didn't take it from you, but you laid it down for sinners like us. For we, are, we confess that we do not render to you the things that are yours, but we thank you, Lord, for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, and for your spirit who changes us daily. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's stand and respond. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Jesus, the Savior, reigns god of truth and love when he has purged our sins he took his seat above lift up your heart lift up your voice rejoice again i say rejoice his kingdom cannot fail he rules over all the earth the keys of death and hell are yours, oh Jesus, give. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. He sits at God's right hand to all his foes submit. And bow to his command and fall beneath his feet. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, Jesus the just shall come. And take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear our angel's voice and trump of God shall sound rejoice. We will hear that archangel's voice, uh, but for now we will sing this doxology and join with heaven above. Even as we are singing, heaven is joining with us in singing. We just don't hear it, but believe it, it is true.
citizens of God's kingdom, receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Please be seated.